Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about memory. Um, so it's generally agreed upon that we have a two component model of memory. The one first component is working memory. Second is long term memory. Um, so working memory is the temporary storage and use of recently presented information. Um, it's sort of like if you think about your workspace at home, you've got maybe the central area where you're working on things, and then you've got places like filing cabinets or stacks of papers or wherever where you're storing information or work to do for later. And it's sort of the same idea where working memory is sort of your active workspace. It's sort of uh, your temporary storage where um, think where your perception is interacting with long-term memory, what, what you're thinking about right now, um, your current actions, the way that you're moving, that's all part of your working memory. Um, so it's also, that includes short-term memory, but also attention related processes and sensory perceptual functions. Um, and so it's important for dealing with it, whatever it is that we're doing right now. And it integrates things that we retrieve from long-term memory and things that we're experiencing and deciding and, and dealing with right at the moment. Uh, compared to long-term memory, which is a relatively permanent storage of information um, and it has relatively unlimited capacity. So there is a limited capacity for working memory. There's only so much that we can think about or remember right in a given moment. Uh, but long-term memory is theoretically infinite. Um, we haven't really figured out how to measure the total capacity of long-term memory, but it appears that there is no you know, ceiling of what can be stored in long-term memory. Um, so working memory has been divided into three subsystems and a possible fourth, it's debated. Um, but the first is the phonological loop. It's responsible for short-term storage of verbal information. Um, visual spatial sketch pads uh, stores visually detected spatial information for short periods of time. So like you might see something and kind of have spatially in your head where things are. Think about like a memory game, like we're flipping over cards and trying to make matches. So like you have sort of a visual memory of where things are in space. Um, the central executive coordinates information and working memory, and that includes information retrieved from long-term memory. Uh, central executive is sort of like the narrative function in your working memory. So like what you're thinking about, your integration of things that you're remembering from long-term memory, your integration of sensory and perception, perceptual um, information. Um, and then the motor store, it's disagreed upon whether that is a fourth subsystem or whether that's part of your visual spatial sketch pad. So that's where we encode kinesthetic information. Um, so our information about our movement, where and how we're moving in space and our memory of what and how we're doing that. Okay, working memory, uh, duration of movement information and in working memory, it lasts about 20 to 30 seconds unless we rehearse it. So if we repeat the movement again and again, and we're rehearsing it, then we can store it in working memory for longer periods of time. But generally speaking, it's about 20 or 30 seconds. Um, for other types of things, not movement information, um, we can generally uh, keep five to nine items, so seven on average, um, in our working memory at a given time. So that could be like digits, like a phone number, uh, objects, movements in sequence. So um, like it could be a dance routine or something like that. So like we generally can remember five to nine items, but we can remember more if we chunk it. Like if we, if we uh, remember those uh, movements or digits or something in chunks. So think about like a phone number. All together with the area code, that could be 10 digits or 11, you know, depending on where you are, um, if you're including a country code, but that could be many digits. It could be 10 digits in the US. So we'd have the three digit area code, and then we'd have the first three digits of the phone number and the last four digits of the phone number. If you had to just memorize 10 straight digits, um, even if it's just for working memory, you're just trying to remember long enough to dial it in your phone or write it down, it'd be very difficult to just remember 10 straight digits but we chunk it into the area code, 
the first three and the last four. And that makes it a lot more possible to keep track of all 10 digits because really it's three items with multiple items in each chunk. Um, so that's an example of how we chunk things. And the more expertise and practice someone has in a certain skill, um, the better they're going to be at making those chunks and being able to remember. So like, um, if we think about like a dance routine, a novice is going to have a lot more difficulty kind of grouping the different steps or moves into chunks. Um, they're going to perceive every little movement as its own item, and they're going to have a harder time being able to go through a whole routine uh, compared to a more expert dancer with more experience and practice and with a higher level of skill they're going to be able to group entire sections of movements into one chunk, and that's going to allow them for a greater capacity in their working memory. Uh, long-term memory, long-term working memory um, develops with expertise in a specific scale, just like what I just described. Um, so experts have a larger amount of relevant knowledge during performance, so they're able to integrate new information more easily. Um, so as a general rule, we integrate new information for whatever skill it is um, more easily when we have something to connect it to. We have something that we relate it to. Uh, it's like if I'm trying to explain to you what the trunk of an elephant looks like, if you don't have any idea what I'm talking about and you've never seen an elephant, you don't know what an elephant is, you won't have anything to connect my explanation to and you're not going to remember it very well and you're not going to learn it or understand it very well. Um, so we understand and learn things better when we have something that we can relate it to. So we have an idea of where to store it and how to understand it. Um, and so the more expert someone is at something, the more of that context they have and the more things that they're able to use to uh, connect that new information and integrate it more easily into their understanding. Um, so subsystems of long-term memory. So three subsystems, procedural, semantic, and episodic. So procedural memory is our memory of how to do something. Um, so procedural memory is something we can demonstrate, but if we had to describe it verbally, we'd have a really hard time doing it. So it's like, if I said, how do you tie your shoes? You would demonstrate it and maybe you could talk me through as you demonstrate it and you'd show and you'd say okay and then this goes that way that goes this way put your hand like this but without demonstrating it you'd have a really hard time verbally describing it um, and that's procedural memory so things that we can demonstrate and show how to do but we have a hard time saying what to do like verbalizing what to actually do um, semantic memory, those that's general knowledge that we accumulate over a lifetime. Um, that includes factual knowledge and conceptual knowledge. So factual knowledge, like how many species of bears are there versus conceptual knowledge, like what is a bear? Um, like your ability to recognize a bear when you see one, even if you've never seen that exact bear before. We can do that because we have conceptual knowledge of what a bear is. Um, and then episodic memory is our personal memory of our lives, of the experiences that we've had, our memory of events, um, and they're in context of time and space. Um, so those are, these are things that we've actually personally experienced, not things that we've learned about or that we have factual knowledge of. Um, now, episodic memory tends to deteriorate more easily than the other systems. So like as memory deteriorates later in life, especially or with certain memory type conditions, uh, we tend to remember more of our procedural memory, like how to tie your shoes or ride a bike. And we tend to remember more factual information. Um, and we tend to lose more of our memory of our personal experiences and our lived um, experiences and events. Okay, declarative knowledge versus procedural knowledge. Um, declarative knowledge would be episodic and semantic memory. So things that we can verbalize and tell the story or explain with words when we need to. Procedural knowledge is from our procedural memory. These are things that we need to demonstrate um, and would have very much difficulty explaining. And it's not to say that we couldn't explain these things. It would just be harder. It would, like most of us, to explain how to tie your shoes, 
you would actually need to go through the motions and think about how you would explain that. And maybe with practice, you would be good at explaining it. But for most of us, it's the type of movement where um, we need to really think it through and practice it and demonstrate it to be able to come up with the verbalization of how to explain how to do it. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.